Hello. In this series of videos, I'm documenting the restoration of my family's Patentium Ebner Model 99V. Hopefully I can take from this to this. Minus the speakers, of course, as they've been lost in time. In my last video, I gave a little history of Patentium Ebner, from its humble origins in southern Germany to its post-war rise in the 50s and its final demise in the late 60s and 70s. As the title of the project suggests, the hardest part it's just finding parts, as PE term tables were never popular here in North America, and it's been well over a generation since they were produced. I did manage to fix a few of the critical parts, the tone arm for one. I utilized some tricks I picked up over the years. There are sources for rubber parts, and I did manage to order some belts, a motor mount grommets, and a platter mat. However, I had to use a little imagination and hacking to make the motor mounts fit. I also did the first circuit fix by adding in a clipped out resistor. Once I got all that done, I used my Variac to power it up very slowly and it actually did run, though it was a little sticky. Before starting any circuit restoration, I find it a best practice to review the schematic and get a general idea of what I'm working on and how it works. A review like this does give you an idea of how many parts you have and how many maybe have to be replaced. These might be paper capacitors and they are most likely 99% bad, either way off tolerance or electrically leaky. The electrolytic caps might still be good, but they will have to be checked and possibly reformed. There are also some other critical parts like the transformers. They have to be okay, or else this project is an absolute no-go. Now I'm not going to go into any great detail on how valve amplification works, as this has been done many times on YouTube, and goodness knows how many websites and online books the resources are out there. I will put a few links in the comments to my favorite sites where you can go out and get a little more detail on the subject. One thing I found out while doing the research for this project was that PE most likely did not build the amp. Seems they farmed out most of their chassis work. In this case, most likely to Telefunken or Dual, or perhaps one of their small remaining cottage workshops that PE was known to use. From what I could read, my German isn't that good, they did do the design work for this amplifier. So, down to brass tacks. What we have here is a two-channel valve amplifier using a single ECL82 valve for each channel. The triode portion of the valve does the first stage amplification of the input signal, while the pentode side of the valve amplifies this signal to give it enough voltage to run the output transformer. Though it is possible to use the 82 in almost any configuration here, it's being used as a standalone single stage Class A amplifier. The 82 is not a very common valve here in North America. In Europe, however, it could be found in any number of three and four valve radios, amps, tape recorders, and turntables. What is interesting for me is the pentode part of the valve. It is a true pentode. Here in North America, we see mostly beam pentodes, such as the 6L6 or 6V6. The difference is the beam pentone utilizes a beam of electrons for its fourth or suppression screen, where the 82s use a real suppressor screen. I could do a very long video on why beam pentodes are more common here in North America, but long videos on monopolies, patent lawsuits, suppression by litigation, questionable business practices will not get my turntable restored. Let's just say that Dutch company Philips held the pentode patent, while well, RCA didn't. Anyway, back to the schematic. To make things a little more understandable, we can break down the amp into separate blocks. First we have the power block, next, input, the amplification block for channel 1, and another amplification block for channel 2, which is actually a mirror channel 1, and finally two output blocks, the left speaker and the right speaker. Looking at the input stage first, we see a common crystal type pickup. These were the standard of phono pickups until magnetic heads moved in as transistors took over the industry. It outputs a good deal of voltage from 0.9 to 1.5 volts compared to a modern magnetic pickup that might give you 150 millivolts. With this much voltage coming out of the crystal, you really only need the single stage, hence the one valve per channel. Anyway, in this stage, we take the right signal off to channel 1 and the left signal to channel 2. Both input signals share a common ground. This yields a sort of stereo effect. 
One interesting thing found on the schematic is the muting switch, which is there to fix the problem of loud noise when changing records. The muting switch cuts off any signal to the amplifier when the tone arm is raised beyond a certain point, thus saving the speaker's anvils from any large thumps that might occur when the tone arm comes down or goes up. The phono crystal is also a high impedance signal source, perhaps 1.5 nanofarads, so it requires an equally high load to ensure that all of the signal will appear across the load. Therefore, the first thing we encounter in the signal path is a 200k resistor. After this resistor, we get into the amplifier proper. The first thing our signal will run into is a path to ground. This is a high pass filter tone stack made up of a 2.2 nanofarad capacitor and a half meg variable resistor. This stack will bleed off any high frequency signal depending on the value selected on the resistor. The higher the selected resistance, the less of the high values of the signal will be bled off to ground, thus affecting the tone of the output signal. What's left of this signal carries on to the next route to ground. Here, any undesirable low value frequencies are bled off to ground through a 30 picofarad cap and a 50k resistor. You will also find a 0.01 UF cap that keeps any stray DC potential off the signal path. The signal then follows along to a 1.2 meg variable resistor that acts as the volume control. This path also bleeds off through a 0.01 UF cap to ground. After the VR in the schematic, there is a dashed line that leads over to channel 2. This is not a component per se, it's just a notation telling us that the volume control for both channels are controlled by the same shaft. Next in the signal path is a 2 meg resistor and it is here to bleed off any negative bias charge that might accumulate on or near the grid. Hence the reason is called the grid leak or grid stopper resistor. The signal is then amplified by the valve and exits via the plate. It likes to take the easiest path to ground, which for it is the capacitor rather than the 200k resistor that leads to ground. In this case we call this capacitor a coupling capacitor because it couples the two amplifying stages together. After the coupling capacitor, our signal runs into another grid leak resistor and then enters the power portion of the valve where it is amplified one more time and moves off to the audio transformer. The audio transformer then takes our now high voltage but low current signal and converts it into a low voltage but high current signal that can properly drive the speaker. The signal then runs off to ground through the 4UF cap as that is a much easier path to ground than the 200k resistor. There is also a 100 ohm resistor on the path as well. You would think the signal would take that path as it is much less than the 50k and the 200k put together. But this path leads to the suppressor screen of the pentode and that's not grounded so the signal just ignores this path. Now we have to go back just a little bit because we have one more path to ground that happens before we get to the output transformer. Part of the signal, mostly very high tones, are going to be blocked by this 3.3 nanofarad cap and will follow this path to ground. Depending on what position the switch is in, either more or less of the high tones of the signal will be passed to ground. This sets basically the range for our tone control. This is accomplished by a capacitor resistor high pass filter in the first position or a resistor capacitor low pass filter in the second switch position. It is interesting to note here that these filters are acting more like a drain. As they don't block the signal, they really just give some portion of the signal a much easier path to ground. So that takes care of the signal path. So let's move on to the DC or B voltage distribution in the app. First we have the B plus that runs through the audio transformer and whatever AC ripple happens to be there will be further reduced by the induction effect of the transformer. It's like having a large filter choke for free. After the audio transformer, B plus carries on its merry way to the plate of the pentode part, the ECL82. Now you might say, wait a minute, there are two alternate ways for the DC to go to ground on that path. Yes, that is true, but these two capacitors were blocked DC, so we really only have one path for the DC. This illustrates how important your coupling caps are. If we have a leaking cap here, your pentode might not even work, as all the DC might pass over to the tetrode part of the valve. 
your amp would probably not even work after this. Or it might release some magic smoke, as suddenly you've got high B plus voltage on parts of the amp that were never designed to take it. Again, stepping back a little bit, we see that some of the main B plus line is tapped off for the B plus plus voltage. On the B plus plus, we are back at the 100 ohm resistor again. And this is the voltage tap for the suppressor grid of the pentode. The suppressor grid needs just a little more potential than the plate. So a small value resistor is used here to drop down from the 200 volts of B plus. Now the triode part of the valve works at a very much lower voltage than the pentode. So we need to drop in a few hefty resistors to drop that 200 down. We also find here our first electrolytic cap. It works mostly with the small value resistor to smooth more AC ripple off the DC. And now for the most mysterious part of valve amplification, the bias. This amp uses cathode bias rather than fixed bias. That means rather than giving the screen a direct negative charge, or C-, we give it an indirect negative charge by making the cathode positive. To accomplish this, a small value resistor is added to the cathode that leads directly to ground. This sets up a negative potential between the plate and the cathode, thus making the screen negative. We also have to add in a capacitor here, as any signal that runs through the grid will also run through the plate and the cathode. AC signal on the cathode will disrupt the bias point of the valve, which will have a very unpredictable effect such as distortion, fading in or out, or even oscillations that you can't even hear. None of these are a good thing, so our AC signal must be removed from the cathode. This is accomplished with a high value capacitor in parallel to our resistor. This will provide a very easy path to ground for any signal present on the cathode. So you can see why this capacitor is called a bypass cap. Finally, to finish off the amp part, we see the low voltage AC input to the heaters on both of the valves. Finally, we get to the power section. We start, of course, with a two prong plug. Next, we rate into a double throw switch for the main power then a pair of shorting bars. Next is a switch where the input voltage for the transformer can be selected, one of 110, 125, 220, and 240. One might be tempted to put the switch in the 125 position, as that's much closer to 120 volts, but that would not be wise. The transformer was set up for 125 volts at 50 hertz, not 125 at 60 hertz. There's a big difference between the two especially for the turntable motor, but I'll let the electrical engineers explain that some better way than I ever could. The best option is to use how the design was intended, and that's the 110 volts at 60 hertz. This small amount of extra voltage will not really harm anything, might even improve things a little, as now there would be a little more voltage on the plates. We also see two fuses at this point. There is a 1 amp and a half amp. I imagine the one amp is just for the motor, as that might draw a little more power depending on what voltage is used in the beginning. Most of what you see at this point in the power section are safety features. I guess with 220 and 240 volts as an option, you might be wise on the, to be error on the side of safety. One usually doesn't see this many features built into the front end of a power supply in North America. Before we get to the transformer, some of the voltage is bled off to the turntable section to run the very quiet and smooth four inductor motor. The transformer is next and it has two output windings, a 200 high voltage for the B voltages and a 6.3 volt center tap for the pilot lamp and valve heaters. The center tap of the heater winding is bled to ground to keep down 60 hertz hum. The B high voltage runs through a diode bridge rectifier and then comes out at about 240 volts of unsmooth DC. The 240 volts then runs through a capacitor resistor capacitor network that smooths out the ripple and drops the voltage down to about 200. So that wraps up the mechanisms of the circuit, and at least for me. The truism when you start playing with old electronics is that you start with this beautiful, lovely schematic, all laid out nice and neat. After a little while, you learn to understand how it works. Then you go to the chassis top and unscrew all the nuts, take off the knobs, and open it up, and you're confronted with something like this. 
a complete rat's nest of wires, components, valves, and other stuff that, to begin with, you really don't know what they are and what they do, and you really just pray you don't make a mistake. This is, of course, what point-to-point -point wiring is all about. You can, of course, have very neat point-to-point -point wiring, but in reality, that wasn't much done in any commercial set. In the commercial world, it's the old story. Produce a product with the least amount of labor that would get the highest yield for your buck. Now, I've managed to pick up a good video camera, which should help me in some documenting some of my projects. So let's start with a quick pan of the chassis. First, we start, as you can see, the two tubes, which are hidden behind the shield. The big tall stack in the middle there is the volume, then the two tone controls, one of the audio amplifiers, and finally the transformer. You can see the voltage selector on top, as well as its two fuses, and the other audio transformer poking out of the side of the chassis. So I think I've covered enough for today, and on my next video I'm going to go into a little more detail on what components I have to replace, and how this amp was put together, and more importantly how am I going to take it apart and then put it back together. Stay tuned for more Valve excitement. Riley, are you going to help me with my next project? Come on, Riley, you like Little Dipper. You're a good dog. Riley, do you like Valves? Yeah, you like valves, don't you, Riley? Valves? Okay, Riley. Maybe later you can give me a hand. No? Okay. Bye-bye, Riley.